For millennia, folks around the world have passed down stories of lost treasure both by land and by sea. Across all corners of the planet, you're bound to happen upon a tale of buried gold, misplaced riches, or disappeared diamonds, no matter who it is you speak to or whatever ledger you pick up and read. Some treasure stories revolve around ancient artifacts detailing the past lives of lost civilizations, resources of newfound knowledge and historical enlightenment. Others revolve around mankind's inherent drive towards wealth and fortune, often coming with lessons on greed, materialism, and the consequences of conquest. Usually, these types of tales take place on the coasts of untamed waters or in unexplored territories of countries far from America, much less the western frontier. However, when taking a closer look at the records and textbooks detailing life in the American West, you'll find there are plenty of similar stories regarding gold, artifacts, and other legendary loot circulating around west of the Mississippi River. Thus, to better grasp the lore surrounding treasure-laden quests from around the frontier, here are two tales of lost treasure originating in the Wild West. Back before the real gold and silver mining booms took hold of the American frontier in the mid-19th century, expedition parties from various countries patrolled the western territories with unbridled optimism that a reward beyond measure awaited their discovery. One such clan of hopeful pioneers was a large French exploratory regime in the last days of the 18th century, consisting of more than 300 men and over 450 horses. These Frenchmen were instructed by then First Consul Napoleon Bonaparte to find gold, silver, or other precious minerals that had been rumored to fill the streams and creek beds of the Rocky Mountains. The men left New Orleans and gathered at the rendezvous point in modern-day Leavenworth, Kansas, which was then considered a small outpost in the heart of the colony of Louisiana. From Leavenworth, the Frenchmen trekked westward into additional Spanish territory, then called the Viceroyalty of New Spain. These regions included the southern half of the Rocky Mountains, where previous French explorers had claimed to have found precious metals and other valuables. Eventually, the expedition made it to the base of the mountains and started to prospect in the general vicinity. Unable to pull together anything of value, the posse pushed forward, this time venturing south towards present-day Summitville, Colorado, just east of the now-famous Wolf Creek Pass. It was here the French expedition made their fortune. Within the countless creeks and small rivers flourishing through the area were hefty amounts of gold deposits, undisturbed for what appeared to be centuries. In fact, there was so much gold, records indicate that it would be worth upwards of 33 million US dollars in modern times. Unable to transport the unexpected trove back east, the Frenchmen traveled north and hid the gold in three secret areas. To make sure they wouldn't forget these remote locations, the party appointed a commanding officer to maintain the map they created for future expeditions. Just as the Frenchmen were preparing to begin their journey home, an unexpected attack by a local warrior tribe of Native Americans descended upon the posse. The 300 or so French soldiers attempted to defend their position, but were quickly outnumbered. As casualties mounted, the commanding officer directed a few of his men to bring the gold out of their three hiding spots so that between battles, the treasure could be buried in new locations. The operation was rushed, and while new maps were roughly etched to signal the new hiding points, most of the men involved were slain, including the aforementioned commander. From the initial battlefield, only 20 to 30 Frenchmen were able to escape in one piece. They headed east for another few days and made it as far as the Front Range Mountains, before being attacked again by the same band of warriors. Another 15 to 20 men were killed in battle, and after the Native Americans retreated, only five Frenchmen from the original 300 were still alive. These five survivors were then met with the harsh oncoming of winter as they shuffled further east back to Leavenworth, Kansas. Another three Frenchmen perished as a result of starvation and overall poor health. The other two were able to weather the cold, but only one would return to Leavenworth still breathing. The Frenchman in question was an animated soldier who went by the name LeBlanc, LeBlanc was dead set on returning to Wolf Creek Pass and digging up the discovered gold, but not before returning to France to report his findings to Napoleon. 
LeBlanc stayed in the Kansas outpost for a few weeks to regain his strength and nutrition before the long journey back across the Atlantic. Once he arrived in France, LeBlanc met personally with the higher-ups of the French government, detailing his trials on America's western frontier and the riches now supposedly buried beneath the Rocky Mountains. The French government was intrigued by LeBlanc's story, and requested a map be brought forth so that a follow-up expedition could be had in the coming months. LeBlanc, withholding two versions of the same map, gave one copy to the French regime and kept one for himself. In due time, another expedition force of 50 men was mounted along the western frontier in America. Records don't distinguish the second posse, so it is difficult to tell if it was arranged by the French officials or LeBlanc himself. Nevertheless, the expedition trekked back towards the Summitville, Colorado area, where the gold was first found, but not before stopping by an outpost in Taos, New Mexico. Here, they hired a local guide to take them back up towards the treasure's resting spot. Nobody would hear from the 50 Frenchmen again for months, until the guide returned to Taos with news of yet another attack by Native Americans on the French expedition. He declared he was the only survivor, and the treasure remained buried. The rest of Taos wasn't so sure, however. Thinking the posse would return with enough riches to share with the outpost, they saw the guide as a liar and a thief, accusing him of murder and taking all of the lost treasure for himself. The accusations reached the Spanish government, and the guide was tried for murder. Little evidence came forth to convict the guide of killing 50 French soldiers in cold blood, and he was acquitted after a short trial. The Taos locals remained stumped, however, and couldn't figure out how 50 men were killed while the lone, small-time guide was able to escape. To this day, some believe the expedition was in fact guided by LeBlanc, who found the gold and killed the rest of his men to claim all the fortune for himself, before paying the guide to return to Taos with the fabricated tale of another bloody Native American battle. While the exact fate of LeBlanc remained unknown, the legends of his treasure map persisted, one of which was championed by a man known as William Yule, who stated he had acquired an exact copy of the original map. William Yule spent his life searching the entirety of the valleys between Wolf Creek Pass and Sawatch, Colorado, but it never amounted to much of anything. From the hands of William Yule, the map then went to another prospector by the name of Asa Poor. Poor was able to find landmarks in the area represented on the treasure map, but the gold was left undiscovered. After Poor's failed mission, he handed the map to one of his two partners, a man by the name of Montroy. Montroy never went back to the Summitville area to retrace his steps, and his version of the treasure map disappeared a few years later. In the years since, the mountain peak just over 100 miles north of the Wolf Creek Pass gold deposits was named Treasure Mountain, as an ode to the lost French gold cache. The mountain and its surrounding foothills and lower valleys are thought to be where the treasure still resides. In the mid-20th century, a family from the Summitville, Colorado area came forward with news that they had found seven of the eight natural landmarks mentioned on LeBlanc's original treasure map. The family claimed to be direct descendants of the legendary Frenchman, and that they had been searching for the lost gold for three generations, away from the public's eye. In 1993, a male member of the family discovered a tunnel in the mountains around Wolf Creek Pass while hunting for elk. The tunnel was quickly determined to have been man-made, and the man decided his only choice was to explore the dig site further. After managing to venture about 20 feet deep into the tunnel, the man found further passage blocked with what appeared to be underground landslide remnants. However, just before the blockage, the man discovered a unique carving on the hillside's wall. Using his flashlight to illuminate the shadows, the man realized the wall carving was the eighth and final landmark from LeBlanc's treasure map, the last clue he needed in his family's long gestating search. The following day, the man and 20 other family members dug 12 feet deeper into the tunnel, clearing the blockage and opening up the hillside. The family was ready to celebrate, but first wanted to light the tunnel with an array of candles so that the men could continue digging past dusk. The light never came though, as the family was met face to face with a large rattlesnake nestling in the tunnel. When they scrambled back outside, another force of nature spooked the party, this time in the form of a colony of bats. The bats swirled around the family, 
unrelenting in their pursuit. Once the family was able to wave the bats off, they finally attempted to light the candles leading into the tunnel, set with a trap to capture the awaiting rattlesnake. Before they could, they noticed the candle at the very end of the tunnel had lit itself, glowing like the eye of a slumbering mountain beast. At the same time, a great horned owl swooped down from the twilight sky and lashed its talons at the party, the final signal to the family that whatever lie inside of the mountains was protected by something unseen. While the folktale of LeBlanc's descendants is the dominating story in regards to the legend of Treasure Mountain, other accounts believe the gold was discovered by the Ute tribal warriors who first attacked the French expedition in the late 1700s. Today, word around America's southwestern region is that the band of Ute took the gold after the battle ended and buried it near the mouth of the Rio Grande Canyon, just under 300 miles south of Treasure Mountain. The lost outlaw loot of Flagstaff takes us back to central Arizona in the year 1880. Construction of the Atlantic and Pacific Railroad was halted right outside of Canyon Diablo after the supplied railroad bridge pieces were determined to be too short to provide safe passage over the arroyo. With the railroad workers stranded in the Arizona desert, a small rugged community named after the canyon popped up, eventually hosting a diverse crew of hidden outlaws and runaway gamblers. The town itself had no lawmen, despite the quick construction of various saloons, brothels, and gambling houses. This led to an increase of criminal activity, considering the outlaws saw Canyon Diablo as the perfect spot to prey on unsuspecting travelers and transplants from Flagstaff, 35 miles to the west. Nevertheless, stagecoaches transporting passengers and cargo to California used Canyon Diablo as an outpost before heading west to Flagstaff and further on to California country. In 1881, during the heyday of Canyon Diablo's lawless torment, a mail carrier transport traveling from the east stopped in the junction to transfer mail to a westbound stagecoach heading towards Flagstaff. During the transfer, the passengers of the stagecoach stepped outside and watched as four large mail sacks were placed on the westbound stagecoach, two of them looking heavier than what was considered normal for the average mail sack. After the transfer was complete and the passengers were well fed, the stagecoach trekked north until they reached the California Santa Fe Trail, which would take them to Flagstaff, then to Needles, California, where the next functioning railroad was positioned. The stagecoach didn't get far, however. After traversing difficult elevation and reaching a steady divide atop the San Francisco peaks, the stagecoach was stopped by five outlaws, riding atop their horses with guns drawn, pointed directly at the heads and hearts of the innocent passengers. The outlaws, who had more than likely spotted the party and its potential fortune in Canyon Diablo, didn't say as much as a word. Rather, the leader of the gang simply motioned for two of his cronies to remove the two heavy mail sacks from the stagecoach. Once the bags were placed at the feet of the bandits, the stagecoach was allowed to press forward. At around 5 p.m. local time, the stagecoach and its flustered passengers arrived in Flagstaff. At the time, Flagstaff was a newly settled junction, consisting of only two stores, four saloons, and a stagecoach station. At the station, an agent and his stage master heard of the robbery and were at first perplexed by the theft of two plain mailbags by a dastardly band of outlaws. At the station, an agent and his stage master heard of the robbery and were at first perplexed by the theft of two plain mailbags by a dastardly band of outlaws. When the stage master couldn't make sense of it, he did his own investigation and learned that the two heavy mail sacks in question were actually large parcels of gold and silver bricks heading to a bank in San Francisco from Albuquerque, New Mexico. The stage master then contacted Wells Fargo, who alerted the Western locales of an increase in highway robberies and outlaws targeting stagecoaches. For years, Wells Fargo had attempted to camouflage their more precious cargo with plain mail bags carrying five gallon whiskey kegs with the gold and various riches hidden inside. Now, it seemed like the five outlaws who had robbed the Canyon Diablo stagecoach had acquired inside information and knew exactly what they were doing when they thefted the mail sacks. Without time on their side, the stagemaster and Wells Fargo teamed up to form a posse of bounty hunters to chase after the bandits and reclaim the gold and silver. 
To aid their search, Wells Fargo pleaded for the U.S. Army to assist. The United States government ultimately agreed, sending along a band of the 6th U.S. Cavalry to scout whatever trail the outlaws might have left behind on the San Francisco peaks. Unable to establish a trace, they hired two Native American scouts to speed up the process. In the end, the reclamation party consisted of 12 party members and successfully located the gang of five outlaws to modern-day Viet Springs, some 8,500 feet above the ground. Up in the mountains, the bandits had tied up their horses to a pole right outside of a makeshift log cabin. They were actually preparing to leave at the time of the cavalry siege and opened fire on the party before they could hop aboard their saddles. Of course, as ruthless and conniving as the stagecoach bandits were, they were no match for the U.S. cavalrymen. All five of the outlaws perished, and the cabin and horses were free to claim by the bounty expedition. Despite the victory, however, the ambush didn't bring the men any closer to the stolen stagecoach loot. Nowhere in the cabin did the party uncover any gold and silver bricks, the treasure now lost to the rocky Arizona wilderness. The news was greeted with optimism by the folks down in Flagstaff, who caught wind of the missing treasure and flocked to Viet Springs in droves. It's said a team of more than 12 men ventured to the abandoned cabin in the coming days, digging up the entire lot, only to find nothing more than the dirt of the earth below them. It didn't take long for the excitement to fizzle out, as Wells Fargo was forced to forget about their losses, and the residents of Flagstaff, Canyon Diablo, and everywhere in between turned their heads to the next stagecoach robbery. By 1883, the railroad to Needles, California was completed, and the rugged town of Canyon Diablo was abandoned by the end of the century. Meanwhile, Flagstaff remained a flourishing community and saw major growth at the hands of the Pacific Railroad. Sometimes, its citizens would hear about the lost treasure up in the San Francisco peaks, hidden in a mountain ledge overlooking the city. The man responsible for driving such claims came from George Viet himself, the property owner of the original outlaw hideout. While George had no official ties to the old bandits, he was aware of the loot that they left behind. He spent the rest of his days digging all over the hillsides, around the spring beds, and he even destroyed the log cabin where the shootout took place to search beneath its floorboards. George's excavation also took him to the lava river cave within the lava tubes, ancient tunnels burrowed out by molten rock from a volcanic eruption 700,000 years ago. These icy caverns weren't discovered until 1915, but were thought to be a popular hideout among small-time outlaws in the Wild West's heyday. In the decades since, treasure hunters from around the country have journeyed to the heart of Arizona to search the mountains west of Canyon Diablo and the lava tubes within for the forgotten gold and silver of Flagstaff. To this day, it has yet to be found, like all the treasures lost to the mysteries of the American frontier.